All right. Well, um, let's get started. Did the uh, homework make any sense? Could, could you figure out anything from it? Um, the, the spacing in music is actually kind of funny because it has so many exceptions in it that like when you do optical music rep recognition or OMR, um, it's not used much because there's, you know, it's not hard and fast. Like, okay, usually longer notes have space after them, but not always. On the other hand, when humans read music, it's extremely important. They've done all sorts of tests where they just, you know, equally space all the notes and see how people can read it and stuff. It makes an enormous difference for a human reader. So it's sort of interesting. And in fact, um, I'm not going to do very much on OMR, but uh, later I'll show some work that we did on it, which is sort of simple, but at least made some use of the music spacing. But uh, yeah, music spacing is a, is a uh, big deal. And, uh, you know, traditionally music was printed in a place where salaries are low, where people had lots of time to do all the music engraving. Um, and uh, so to try to automate some of that by computer um, is still a real challenge. And, uh, and the best music printing is still done highly interactively. It's kind of like the best PCB layout, you know. The program does it, most of it automatically, and then you fix all the important things. All right. Um, let's see here. We got. Uh, am I in the right place here? Lecture Q and A, live Q and A. Well, that's pretty odd. There's like almost nobody on. Okay. Well, at least you guys are here. Either that or the thing isn't working right. Anyway, who knows? Um, uh, hopefully, hopefully the videos and uh, the rest of the stuff is working. Okay, so um, today um, I want to end history, which isn't, doesn't have anything to do with the weather and doesn't have anything to do with uh, anything ominous. Uh, I just, you know, been talking about history stuff, and I sort of want to finish that up. There's endless stuff we can talk about in history. Uh, in each one of these decades, all sorts of things happened, and you know, I just sort of touch the surface of it, but um, then I want to move on to the music encoding topic, and that's why you did this uh, music typesetting thing, because I want to cover a lot of different topics. The typesetting is one direction, and then uh, and today I'll also talk about music XML and, uh, and also um, o OMR some. All right, so to finish up um, uh, this... Uh, uh, this history topic. Uh, one of the things that's more recent than uh, since the 90s, I guess, but you know, after MIDI, after general purpose computers got to be uh, higher performance, uh, in the 90s, there was often the, the claim that general purpose computers could do everything. Uh, it's more and more true. I mean, now I, re I just uh, today saw a post for. Uh, which I had noticed before, on Piazza asking about, well, why would you use a special purpose processor? Uh, you know, it's a processor that's in those continuums out there. And it turns out those processors are, those continuums were built 12 years ago. Uh, and that processor is still very competitive with a standard platform, but only for highly optimized code for that processor. Good morning. Hey, did they give you a coffee drink downstairs, or did you not try? I did try. Ah, oh, man, go down there and tell them I sent you. If you made it here, that that's too good. Ah, excellent. Uh, hey, Sean, thanks for telling me it works. Uh, yeah, yeah, head down there. Tell them I sent you. Um, uh, all right. Yeah, in general, though, you know, the idea is that we come at eight, but I can't do that today, uh, strictly. Okay, so... Um, uh, yeah, so in uh, uh, so physical models basically um, are pretty different than traditional synthesis things because they tend not to have oh an oscillator and a filter and another oscillator, right? They tend to be uh, more complex programs. Uh, that uh, in fact the two main way of doing physical modeling that we'll talk about in this well we'll talk about three I guess but two of them are. Uh, uh, hey, if you need a coffee drink, you better go down there and get it. Just tell them I sent you. I, I, I know, you know, you're a few minutes late, don't worry. Not, not today. In, in the future, though, try to make it. Um, so, um, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, so the, the hardware is, you know, at the point where we can do that. So why do physical modeling? 
um, you know, what you're doing in physical modeling is simulating some aspect of the acoustic instrument. And the main two ways, as I was going to say, um, the main two ways of uh, uh, doing physical modeling, uh, one of them is sort of time domain, where you actually model of wave propagation times, and another one is sort of frequency domain, where you model resonances in systems and, and how they interact. And so um, we're going to talk about those later in the course, but the real question is, like, why even bother with this? Um, well, you're simulating acoustics of an instrument. And uh, the first thing I can do is, well, you can make imaginary instruments. So I'm going to play you a quick example here. Uh, this is an example that you already heard, but it's sort of interesting in this uh, violin, viola, cello, bass example. I'm going to play a later part of it. If it plays at all. So that I, what did I just do? Why did it go away? Uh, I'll learn how to use computers. Okay, I'll say it ahead of time. Uh, so uh, I, I just tried to pause it, but I guess I killed it. Um, so the uh, the idea is here. Uh, so we have this. Uh, physical model, which is not either of the two types I was just talking about. And this is another kind of physical modeling, uh, sort of a light version of physical modeling. But in any case, in it, one of the things you can do is model the size of the instrument. And so you can imagine sort of what it would sound like, and you can model it uh, if you have a very small cello or a very large cello. You get different resonances, you get you know different, different things going on. Um, what's, what I find interesting about it is that as soon as you start changing the size of the cello as you're playing, it doesn't, the whole illusion sort of goes away. But it sounds really cool. And in some ways sort of more interesting maybe because, you know, if you really wanted a cello, you might as well get a real cello. Come on. I can do this. So one reason to do it is to do, to be able to affect an, a sound by things that are sort of natural world-like, uh, like different sizes. For instance, if you had this in additive sine wave synthesis, it'd be very hard to know, like, well, what do you do to it make, to make body sound larger or something? But if you have a model, that's just one of the parameters of the model, and you, you mess with that parameter. So um, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, but uh, even more fundamental than that is if you have a model... If you have a model, then uh, you get timbre interaction of sequential notes. And that's super important. When you have, uh, uh, when you have a, a sequence of notes, you know, a note sounds different depending on what note came before it. And that's, you know, that's just absolutely fundamental to acoustic instruments. In fact, one of the reasons that, that uh, you know, I, I can't imagine anybody has ever sat through several hours of one synth patch listening to a MIDI keyboard play that one patch and never changing the patch, and then, you know, still wanting to hear more. It just doesn't happen, because 
you know, you get bored of it. And, and the MIDI synthesizer is great features. You can get lots of different timbres. And so you take advantage of that and keep it interesting that way. But one of the things is that, one, one of the reasons that the patches get boring is that each note is sort of an island. It's just this thing that's almost like copy and pasted in with another one. And they interact maybe by some reverb or something, but not at all in an interesting, subtle way like an acoustic instrument would for a sequence of notes. So um, that's one of the things uh, you're trying to get out of it is you know, how uh, uh, sequence, uh, sequential notes interact and um, how simultaneous notes interact. I played you an example the other time where there was uh, a Moog Voyager, but it was a digitally um, uh, emulated piano. And again there, that does, you know, that emulation of the piano, that physical model of the piano does uh, sympathetic vibrations. And that is a subtle effect for many things. But a sampler, even if it has hundreds of recordings of notes per key, you know, this is something fundamental about a piano that's just totally missing. And people sort of get used to, well, it's missing, and, you know, don't, don't expect anything anymore. But, but actually, it's a, uh, uh, it's a pretty big deal. Um, I, you know, in, in New York City, I know some uh, uh, world-class pianists there, and every single one of them, plays uh, synthesizer at home to practice. I mean, if nothing else, her neighbors would go insane hearing the same, hearing the same lick over and over and over again that they're practicing, right? You know, it would just be crazy. But none of them play a synthesizer in concert, not even a physical modeled one. And uh, so, you know, there, there's still a difference there. And it depends, you know, if you say, well, those are really picky people. Well, but that's what a lot of great art is, right, is the last half a percent. It's not, it, it's not what you or I could do. Um, so, why is, simu uh, why is simulation of a system or physical modeling uh, uh, so different from sampling? Uh, notes affect each other, transitions between notes, interaction with simultaneous notes, uh, important in acoustic instruments. Um, why is the simulation so difficult? In fact, I would say, if you have a MIDI keyboard and you have a choice, hey, do you want to do a physical modeled thing or do you want to do samples? Most of the time, the samples are a better choice. So I'm sort of, you know, saying the opposite of what I just said before. But what happens is when you have a MIDI keyboard, all you're doing is starting and stopping things. And, no, you know, acoustic instruments don't work that way. In fact, the ones where the physical models work the best are percussion instruments and piano, uh, things like that. You know, things are struck because... Uh, there's at least less inter in, uh, interaction in the acoustic, and it's closer to just starting and stopping things. But um, so one of the big things about physical models is it's really hard to find the p good parameters for a model, where lots of people, maybe not you and I, but lots of professional recording studios can make excellent recordings of, of instruments, really excellent snapshots. And if you play an individual note, it'll sound great because it's one of these excellent snapshots. Where if you have a model, it's hard to make a model that'll match one of those snapshots if you just play one note. Uh, you know, that's, that's a very, very challenging thing. Another thing about models that, that makes it uh, difficult it, um, is that when you don't have interaction with the sound, what's the point of having the model be changeable? Right? I mean, if, if the great thing about your model is, well, you can affect things in these slight ways, but you know, if you're only starting and stopping things, it doesn't really make any... The, the, you're not taking advantage of the things that could be good about it. So in general, physical models, if you, if you play just individual notes on a piano, or say on a, uh, on a um, whatever, any instrument you want that's physical model versus sampled, the sample will generally sound better. And it's only once you really play it in context and once you interact with the sound, uh, which is only a very limited way possible on a MIDI keyboard, um, uh, that the physical modeling works. Now, in the continuum, physical modeling is the main way we do things. Uh, partly because we use these shark processors, which I'll talk about, uh, which are super powerful, but only if you don't use lots of memory. And physical, you know, sampling takes lots of memory, physical models don't. But also because we have the whole Egan matrix set up so that you can change parameters as you go, right? That's the whole idea of these XYZ formulas and all these different things you can do. Um, so that a very skilled performer can get tiny nuances out of it that, you know, on first listen, you wouldn't even notice. But long-term is what makes the music interesting. Uh, it ma makes the timbres interesting. All right. Um, 
Any questions about physical models? So uh, next thing I wanted to talk about uh, is uh, analog simulation. So uh, this is a pretty big topic because I lived through the time when <laughs> musicians were bemoaning the fact that they had these, uh, uh, these, these new transistor amplifiers and they're saying, oh man, you know, the, 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 uh, the old uh, tube amps were so much more, you know, so much better. And, and, and so maybe they'd say wrong things. They might have said, you know, reproduce the sound so much better or something, which isn't really true. But anyway, arrogant engineers like us would just kind of laugh at them and say, look, you can look at this transistor characteristic in this amplifier and see that it's linear, that it's, you know, just fantastic quality compared to the dirt in your tube amplifier. So, you know, who are you kidding? And um, that arrogance went on for a long time. You know, and engineers just made better and better amplifiers that were more and more linear and had better and better characteristics and totally missed the boat. Because the thing about the tube amplifiers uh, that was so important that, that, that they totally missed is, well, when you overdrive a tube, it does interesting things. And the tubes that you overdrive that don't do interesting things, well, they weren't built into amplifiers. Obviously, not every tube is good for that. But many of you know, the ones that survived and the ones that were really made into the famous tube amps uh, overdriving them was super important. And guess what? When you overdrive your perfectly linear, wonderful um, uh, uh, transistor amplifier, well, <laughs> it's just garbage. And, you know, and so, so, you, so, well, you don't overdrive it, but then you lose the punch you get from the tube amp. Um, you, you lose a lot of other things, too, that, that engineers would say are detracting because they affect the sound. But actually, they, they are part of the sound. Right? It's, it's a mistake. You know, we always have this idea in engineering that the more general purpose something is, the better it is, and the fewer limitations it has, the better it is, and all these kinds of things. But that's just dead wrong. Much of the beauty of acoustic instruments comes from their limitations. And much of the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, uh, much of the beauty of the, the uh, tubes come also, in a way, from their limitations. The overdriving, the punch you get from a tube amp is a big deal, but also it has all sorts of weird time characteristics. Right? A, a tube warms up and cools down, and, and its characteristics change over short periods of time and over longer periods of time. And while some of those things are horrible things that engineers that were designed those two amps were trying to minimize, the fact that they're there is still really important and still is actually a positive thing. Uh, and... Uh, it's similar to I don't know what you know if you're if you're listening to say organ pipes or something and it's bothering you that you hear all this air rushing noise and you know you're dreaming of an organ pipe where you wouldn't hear air rushing noise. well I don't know at some point you know that air rushing noise is part of the beauty of the instrument and and to wish it away doesn't it would be something different it might be okay you know, it might be a useful instrument too but it wouldn't be the same thing and it certainly wouldn't just on a linear scale be better. So, now analog simulation, there's loads of analog simulations out there, and um, almost all of them are garbage. Uh, almost all of them are just poor, you know, crummy imitations of something, but certainly there are excellent ones too. And I know people that are very, very particular uh, people that work in high-end studios with a great ear, far beyond what I could actually hear, uh, that actually say, oh yeah, you know, these, some of the simulations are fantastic. You gotta be careful though with simulations. Say for instance you, I don't know what, you, you had uh, a Hammond organ. Okay, to simulate that on a computer, the first thing you need to do is, now this isn't a tube, but still, it, it's the same sort of problem, and a Hammond organ, uh, many of its limitations and problems are what make it beautiful. For instance, one of the things is that, well, you have this weird thing about harmonics not being uh, uh, multiples of fundamental. So the, the first thing goes is, like, no, don't take a uh, digital recording of it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you really need individual oscillators like the tone wheels. And you can emulate on that level, and that's great. You can emulate the draw bars and stuff. But what you're not getting in that is all the problems with a Hammond organ. For instance, when you play a note, Actually, you hear this crunch of all the, or you often hear 
and this effect of all the different uh, tonios coming in at different times, because there's all sorts of imperfections in the draw bars, there's all sorts of problems with the context, making and breaking exactly at the same time, and all these other things, and, and that's part of a, of a sound. When, when you digitally simulate it and make everything perfect and get rid, rid of all those impurities, well, and you're playing it on a keyboard that has very different resistance and very different, uh, I mean, you know, when you play it, feels different, it's not the same thing anymore. And, and uh, so have you made something better? You know, uh, so, so be very careful about that. Okay, questions about that? Okay, so uh, there are cool uh, uh, things uh, uh, to be done, and an analog simulation is a big deal, uh, especially because it, 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 if uh, used in the, in the right situations, uh, yeah, it means you don't have to keep up all this hardware. You know, there's lots of nice things about it, but just be very careful about the whole you know, simulating things and replacing things with your iPhone is not always, is not always, you know, ideal. And uh, uh, so, uh, but as an engineering problem, analog simulations are very, very challenging to do well. Uh, just to tell you, I mean, ma most of those simulations that work well, I think, start as spice simulations. They just really try to emulate everything about it, and then they try to clean that up some and make it better and better. But uh, you guys know what spice is? You guys use that? No, yeah, okay, some of you do. But anyway, it's a standard simulation tool. Um, but uh, yeah, it has to be done very carefully. And the way you learn about these things is you could try to get a textbook or read online, but most of these things are company secrets, right? If a, you know, when a company finally figures out how to do something really well, um, so, so really the way to get into it is to apprentice with companies. And even there, you know, they're quite aware that if you want to apprentice with them and then run away with all their ideas, that wouldn't be ideal. So a lot of this stuff is actually uh, very much uh, um, still not generally known how to make the really good simulations. All right, um, software synthesis. So I just want to talk about synthesis in general now. Uh, these are more general ideas, but in software synthesis, there's all sorts of issues. Like one of the things is dedicated sound computation hardware. And I mean a dedicated DSP or a dedicated CPU, or in rare cases, people use GPUs to do some audio things, usually audio ray tracing and such, which is what Professor uh, Cheng does. But, but uh, you know, a dedicated thing versus generic. And people say, oh, well, you don't need a dedicated thing. Everybody knows you need a dedicated GPU for graphics, and one of the reasons why audio is in such a trivial state compared to what it should be, compared to what, G you know, graphics are, is because of that attitude. And it's weird because audio is actually easier than graphics. I guess graphics is so hard it hit people in the face that, you know, hey, it's a two-dimensional thing and it's just too hard. Uh, well, audio is only one-dimensional, uh, at least when you finally hear it. Um, but uh, there is a lot that could be done in audio. And in games, you know, it's sort of sad that a sound designer for a game usually just means somebody who can pick the right sound for the right time. And like a, a game with just amazing sound is one where it does a head-related transfer function. It has a filter that filters it depending on what direction it comes from. You know, it's just, it's like, well, that's, that's step one, you know, <laughs> but, but that's sort of, you know, it, it reminds, you know, it, the digital, I mean, the visual counterpart would be, say you only had a clip art and it moved around and, 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 and you know, that would be your 3D art. Um, uh, that's where audio is right now. And, you know, if you're in a cave, maybe there's a generic cave filter. But this idea that, that you actually, like, when you're looking, if you're in a cave and there's water dripping in a puddle and somebody at the far end of the cave has a flashlight, right, you see reflected light in that puddle wavering in and stuff. You know, you, you, there's really a lot of fancy stuff going on there and nothing on that level is done in audio. In fact, you can't even find the information. If you wanted to know what is the specular reflection of audio of this wall or of any material. You can't even find a chart of that. You can find all that stuff for, for, um, uh, for video, right? You know, how transparent is the material, how much does it reflect, and all these angles um, at which different things happen. All that stuff is available. For audio, nobody even has bothered to figure it out yet. So it's, it's really audio is in its absolute infancy. And, and you'll know that, like, if you walk into a cave in Minecraft and there's no light, right? 
it's awfully weird that you can't just go by hearing. I mean, certainly a blind person could, or a blind person could hear this wall next to him or pit next to him. But in audio, we do none of that. So um, this idea of dedicated computation hardware is an, a rare thing. The main place you see dedicated hardware is when it's built into a synthesizer well, like built into the continuum. But normally, people just like to do generic stuff um, and, and use the same computer they use for Microsoft Word. A uh, dedicated music performance device, similarly. You know, uh, a, a music keyboard uh, or a continuum or something else uh, b beside, besides doing a, a generic mouse. And a lot of stuff is just done by generic interface. You know, if you look in the acoustic world, you just think of all the different devices and techniques and all the different kinds of mallets for a particular instrument people use and all that. Eh, here it's all reduced to mouse clicks and, and uh, maybe a music keyboard uh, or mostly a typing keyboard. Um, so, so that's sort of, you know, the genericization does make things more accessible, does have some advantages, but it's also something to really be aware of. There's not the simple thing, oh, it's good or it's bad. It's just a fact, you know, and it's very different than the acoustic world. And whenever you have a big change like that, you got to say, well, what are you missing? You know, well, what, what, what could you bring to the new world that, that the old world already had? Um, another thing I'd wanted to talk about here is just what are the jobs, you know, in software synthesis? So at the top level, there's sort of a performer and ranger. This is often the person that um, is performing in, you know, like in the Blizzard games or something. They, they have uh, orchestras that record music for different scenes. And there's somebody that plays continuum there. And they arrange the music to work particularly well on the continuum and to blend well with orchestra. So that's what the performer and arranger does. And they select different presets, and they even modify the presets small ways. But then there's a sound designer who, if it's, an, I'm doing an Eden Matrix example because that's what you're familiar with here, but the same is true no matter what systems you use. You've got this sort of division. Then you've got the sound designer. Sometimes it's the same as a performer or arranger, but usually not. And the sound designer is the person that made that Eden Matrix preset and sort of figured out, well, those barrels, you know, what should they control so that the performer and ranger can get the effects they like? Uh, like one of the recent things we added just because the performer rangers were, have all been asking for it is a tilt e uh, equalizer at the end of everything, which isn't, I don't think, in any of the videos, but you can mess around with it sometime. And it's just a really simple thing. It's like, you know, I need this brighter. And yes, you can easily buy a box to do that, or you, or you could try to edit the Egan matrix, and for you guys, maybe, okay, that wouldn't be that hard. But for somebody who's trying to get some music played, uh, it's a big deal to just have that involved, and uh, they can get it exactly the way they want it on their own and uh, quickly. Uh, so the sound designer really determines what uh, uh, the preset is. Then there's a DSP programmer, which is what I do, and I'll talk about a little bit today, but the idea there is that that's... Uh, Somebody who does um, uh, the, the low level, in, in this case, shark programming on the Egan matrix. And the kinds of decisions I have to make is usually when you're programming a low level thing like that, I'll, I'll talk about optimizations and stuff a little bit, but you have to decide, well, what options will the sound designer have? Because anytime you're highly optimizing something, the fewer feature, the fewer options, the more things that are set about it, the more efficient you can make it. And so it's really important to make the right decisions because if you make too many things fixed and set and unmovable, then the whole thing doesn't isn't very interesting for the for the sound designer. But if you can make a um, if you can uh, uh, pick the right things, and and another example is like any time you can do vector math, like any time you can do a hundred of the same thing, and you can arrange your program so that everything else is set up, though, even though these may, the same thing may be a similar computation for lots of different notes, for lots of different things, if you can make one core loop that has some setup for it and does this hundreds of times, um, and is super, super efficient, that really matters. But again, how do you arrange things so that you can pull that off? And, and that's a lot of what the DSP programmer does. Okay, I'm going to play you uh, just a sound example because I shouldn't talk all the time. This is a uh, uh, software synthesis by Stephen Pope, who was uh, a, a famous guy in music research and was um, you know, editor of Computer Music Journal and various other things, um, but also a composer. Um, in this case, this was done at a German conference. Let's see if I can find my notes on this. Uh, it's voice processing, so it's a um, uh, it's called Kombination 
F or XI. Uh, it was done in uh, uh, for a conference in um, Hamburg, and this was like at the very beginning of real software synthesis. Where computers were just getting powerful enough. Now, this computation took a long time. This isn't like we do now, where you run a DAW and everything runs in real time. That it wasn't that, but this was 1989, and it was a significant amount of processing. Um, this is, uh, if you speak German, you might recognize as Helmspittel. Um, if you don't speak German, German poetry tends to be, um, I don't know, one word not describing it would be uplifting. So uh, this is uh, one of these things that's about ambivalent uh, disorientation. But what this is, is this is one voice, male one, and a female voice, reading this poem. They're reading in a very bored, almost drugged out sounding way, but that's supposed to be that way, that's part of the art. But then what you're hearing, all the music you're hearing, all the other background you're hearing, is manipulation of the voice. So in fact, if you have vowel sounds or something, they tend to wobble a little bit. So you hear some wobbles at the beginning and that sound, it's part of the same voice that you're hearing uh, reading it. So I'll play you a bit of this. Um, again, this is uh, uh, Stephen Pope, Combination uh, Elf. Very much time stretch there. So that's a kind of composition you really can't do on your Moog modular or, you know, even in most, I mean, this is really a new thing, you know, for software synthesis. And is, uh, um, yeah. So, and that's sort of the last part of uh, uh, the history stuff I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk a little bit then about the uh, uh, synthesizer, uh, well, the DSP programming underneath the Egan matrix, just because I get questions about it, and, and because many of you like DSP, you know, this is sort of interesting. Um, so, uh, I need to say that the, the vast majority of actual DSP done is done like on cell phones in Java or something. So, you know, cell phones already not a very powerful processor, and then you're using Java, which, you know, gets you another 1% of what it could possibly do. And it, it's just very, very poor use of resources. But it, it turns out it doesn't matter. You know, if it's fast enough and it does the job you need, then so what? And it turns out for 
a lot of things. It's just not cost effective. People don't want to spend the time to learn how to program special algorithms. And even when you look at GPUs, yes, it's true that all these games use GPUs, but those game programmers didn't write those GPU programs. There's like a handful of standard GPU programs that everybody uses, and a very small set of people actually wrote those core programs, and what the game programmers do is prepare data structures for those GPU programs. So even in the game universe, you know, you have to learn the libraries for whatever engines you're using, but you're not learning special architectures, you're not doing all that, you're, you're really preparing stuff for stuff that somebody else did. So while I really like this, and there's always been a um, lack of enough people that know shark programming. If you actually know shark programming, there's lots of people who want to buy you up, especially car companies now. Now that we're going to electric cars, and sound quality in cars is so much better. You know, they really would like to do this. And for a car company, it really matters. Does the computer chip cost $600 or does it cost $7? And I know that sounds silly, but actually for most people it doesn't matter. They already have the desktop computer. And, you know, if, if, if the chip in there was really expensive, so what? Uh, they already own it. And they're using, or, or, their comp or you know, it's already at work and stuff. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, those costs don't matter until you're trying to embed something. You know, and then if you're trying to put it in the car and you really want high-end processing, uh, then, yeah, then there's uh, more reason to want to do it. But, uh, again, very few people know this I'm only mentioning because it's something that I know. I had tried teaching about it in the past, and unfortunately there's enough time invested that, I don't know, I, I could do another seminar possibly next fall or something about it, but uh, uh, we'll see. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, so I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so this is um, uh, high-performance DSP programming, and now when I talk about high-performance DSP, that's not the same as what you're doing Java on the cell phone. Similar algorithms, but the algorithms are only a small part of it. You actually really rewrite things to make them fit the architecture. Very much like the great GPU programs that really do well, uh, whether they're Bitcoin mining or graphics or whatever they are, are specifically written to take advantage of the GPU architecture. You know, they're not written the same way that you would write it for an x86 architecture. And so there's all sorts of other levels to this way beyond, oh, you know, I'm learning this environment or I'm learning an assembly language or something. Um, so here is an example um, that I want to do uh, uh, is uh, uh, on the shark. Um, so I want to talk about the shark a little bit because unfortunately Harvard architectures are older than von Neumann architectures, right? Harvard architectures were they had a separate data and separate memory for program than for data. Why did they have, well, they didn't even realize you could actually use the same kind of memory for that. They just seemed like really different things. Not to us, that seems weird, but at the time, you know, they just seemed like different things. And von Neumann figured out, well, look, we could actually, memory is generic, you know, we could use one memory for everything. That has a lot of advantages and that clearly won out. Um, but there are some very old Harvard architectures that are still around, and then there's these modern ones. So uh, what is cool about a modern architecture for a, Har a Harvard architecture, especially when it has a, you know, the subset of operations that you really want for audio, you've got multiple data buses. And, and in the Shark, so this is very specific, uh, the analog devices, which in my humble opinion is, is the king of the heap there, uh, it has about 60 DMA channels. What does that mean? Well, all your I.O. is done in the background by cycle stealing. You don't waste any bus cycles. You don't, you, you know, you're not checking, oh, is this ready or is that ready? Everything is delivered to memory for you. And that's really important. Just offload all the junk. You know, don't spend your time messing around with, uh, with data streams or anything. Um, there's a long instruction word, which means you can do many different combinations of things. Uh, there's, uh, you, you know, not just, oh, I want to add or I want to multiply or I want to multiply and add, but a whole bunch of different combinations of parallel operations. Uh, there's multiple memories, which means the internal memory buses, uh, you can, uh, if you use, if you have your data set up and carefully organized in all the different memories so that you're accessing a different memory on each of the different buses, then you can do lots of things in parallel, right? You can get orders of magnitude more throughput than you would on a normal computer. On a von Neumann machine, uh, 
you know, you got to fetch the instruction out of the same memory that you're fetching the data out of. And yeah, you can add caches and stuff, but this has caches too. That, you know, that's not the issue right now. Uh, you have lots of parallel buses here. Uh, and if you want to take some numbers and manipulate them and store them back into memory, all that's done in one cycle. Because, you know, as long as you use different memories for the different stuff, um, uh, the, uh, the multiple memories and multiple buses is very important. There's also multiple ALUs. Um, and uh, so they call that SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. There's multiple floating point units. There's multiple address generators. And address generators are fancy. They do all sorts of different address stepping automatically so that there's no overhead for anything to do that. Uh, there's all sorts of integrated audio specific peripherals, which has to do with those DMA channels. Um, uh, zero overhead um, operations with DMA and uh, floating point and fixed point math both. It turns out that both are really important. You know, floating point math is a joy to work in for, for uh, DSP. There's a lot of things you can blow off that when I was a student, man, you know, it's just really hard. On the other hand, uh, there's lots of things that did, you know, is still in math is easier for or the algorithms are better known or whatever. Okay, so, um, so these are the things about a Harvard architecture as opposed to a von Neumann architecture. Um, so what happens here is you have these data structures here, and uh, the basic idea of this algorithm, as far as the SIMD goes, is you've got to compute a sine of an angle. And I'm just compute the cosine at the same time. Because you can, uh, the, uh, we're going to use a polynomial uh, to uh, compute them, a polynomial I got from a super smart dude at CERN. But, um, uh, the uh, uh, you're gonna we're gonna compute sine and cosine at the same time because it's a polynomial and basically polynomials well they depend on polynomial coefficients so we do all the same instructions for two CPUs but one of them is the sine coefficients one of them is cosine coefficients and this is a pretty different way than uh, normally. Uh, sines and cosines are uh, computed on your sheet. Does it does it have this little graphic on it? Okay, good. Um, so uh, here's these quadrants. Uh, this is quadrant one from minus pi over four to pi over four, and quadrant two, three, four. So what this does is this actually only computes sine and cosine in the first quadrant. That's all the algorithm can do, and it's a polynomial algorithm. So what it's really doing is it has a polynomial function that approximates this line here, which you know when it's going through zero, you know sine x of x equals x, but uh, I'm sorry, x equals sine of x. Uh, it's 45 degrees at the center, but it's curved, you know, it's not just a straight line. Uh, so you, you have a, a higher order polynomial that does that, and then you've got a uh, um, higher poly uh, order polynomial that does this sort of bump here, that, that part, you know, that first quadrant uh, from minus uh, 45 degrees to 45 degrees of the cosine. And that's all it can do. And it always does that. It turns out in a lot of uh, audio DSP, you need the sine of the angle and the cosine of the angle, both. A lot of times when you're computing filter coefficient, and anyway, it's for free. If you're going to compute the sine, you might as well also compute the cosine. Not only that, this is actually can only do the first, this polynomial is only for the first quadrant. And that's sort of optimized, you know, the fact that it's polynomial at all, and that's some other kind of approximation, and the fact that we do it only for the first quadrant for sine cosine, it's all optimized for the shark specifically. And then um, uh, what happens then is uh, this is all it computes, and that's all it computes. Now let's say your actual angle was 140 degrees. You know, you're over here. Well, it's the same as this, upside down, right? Just negated. Or say uh, 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 you were looking for, I'm, I'm sorry, that would be the uh, cosine. Uh, say you're looking the cosine uh, here, you know, the cosine of 50 degrees, right? Well, that's the same as the sine here um, negated. So you just flip sines and uh, flip between sine and cosine, flip uh, the SIGNs and flip the SINEs um, um, to get the right part of the function for your sine and your cosine. And can always compute sine and cosine for any angle that way. Does that make sense so far? Okay, and then uh, the only other thing, you know, it's not essential that 
that, that, that you understand every detail here. The main thing is I want to give you the idea of what's going on here and why this isn't something that is C. You know, we always hear this myth, oh, our C compiler is so good, it's just as good as Simlang's programming. And that's like step zero in an optimization. I mean, come on. You know, there's no way that a C program would take some other s algorithm and know to convert that algorithm to a polynomial expression, especially not this polynomial expression. This polynomial, you know, right, it's a, you take a totally different algorithm. You won't find this algorithm in your standard C library. You use other algorithms. And those algorithms are fine for x86s. Maybe even more efficient than this would be on the x86. But this is super good on, on, on a shark. So the polynomial is also sort of this funny form here. Like you can look here, um, like for the cosine, you got uh, a coefficient 0 plus uh, um, x uh, q2 times uh, quantity coefficient 1 time, uh, plus x. Q anyway, you have this funny, uh, 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 funny setup which comes up, you know, from multiplies and adds. And that, the, the, I take no credit for this. This was uh, uh, Mr. Pedersen at CERN who came up with this and figured out, well, okay, we're doing 32-bit floating point math here, and we want a result that's within, a, you know, uh, a, a least significant bit of correct. And that's a real trick to, to make it, uh, to make, er you know, errors in each calculation step cancel out so that the final answer is correct. Um, but anyway, he did that. I just implemented it. And, and so, so I, I, I did this optimized thing at the beginning, optimized thing at the end, and made it work with our C compiler. So I just call this from C code. But this is one kind of optimization that's really important where the algorithm is just different than what you would write otherwise. Um, another kind of optimization uh, I want to mention here is um, uh, here for modal physical modeling. So this is the kind of uh, physical modeling that I actually I like best for the continuum because it's very robust. We'll talk about it more later. Um, uh, every kind of physical modeling has its challenges, but I, I really like this. So this is sort of the frequency domain modeling. We're mostly modeling uh, the resonances of systems. We'll talk about it more later. But anyway, you need a large number of biquad bandpass filters. Why? Well, each one of those is a resonance. So you need hundreds of those. Okay, so the idea here is, well, how can I make a bi-quad bandpass filter, hundreds of them, super, super efficiently? Um, so uh, we got these memory structures here, which you don't need to look at in detail. I just circled some things. Data is carefully assigned to different on-chip memories. There's four of them, really matter, well, not, incl not including the um, program memories. But uh, there's different uh, memories there. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, the program caches and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, uh, you got to carefully assign them in different memories so you don't have conflicts. Um, uh, again, something that a C compiler couldn't do for you. You know, you can't restructure your thing. In fact, all C language isn't very well set up for this because you have a data structure and all the related data to an algorithm is in this data structure. That's just good programming. Well, when you start optimizing here, though, you got to break up that data structure because you got to have one for this memory, one for that memory, one for that memory. And like almost all optimization, it ha it's fun. It's like playing Sudoku or something. You know, you can screw around with it and, and get just incredible increases in speed and stuff. At the same time, it does make your code uglier. And I, oh, no matter what optimization, never start by optimizing, never start in the same language. Always write everything in C, then find the loop that takes 100% you know, or 99% of your processing power and optimize the heck out of that. But when you write it in C, Write the algorithm, the underlying algorithm in mind, you know, you know about what kinds of things you can optimize later and stuff. So make it so that that core loop has all the things it needs to optimize, uh, to be optimizable. But anyway, so um, uh, simultaneous memory uh, accesses, SIMD computation, blah, blah, blah. Ah, this is not the next page. Here we are. Yeah, so this... Uh, this page here, uh, the long and short of it is, you set it up so you have this core loop here. This core loop um, has different colors in it. Now, one of the things that happens here is uh, one time through the loop, it does, um, uh, let's see, which, which one does it do first? Uh, it does the green thing uh, for, for a particular uh, pair of bandpass filters. The green instruction affects that one particular pair of bandpass filters, and the next time through the loop, 
um, uh, the red ones affect our, our computations for that one. And the next time through the loop, uh, the blue ones finish it up. So you've got this interleaved loops, which is a weird technique, but very, very useful. So that um, if you actually looked at this code, it's not straight line code working on one thing. You're working on a whole vector of, uh, of bandpass filters. And uh, you have interleaved loops. Um, you also have different memories. And you use SIMD. Um, so the, the long and short of it is each instruction cycle here. So on, on a modern continuum, I don't know what the timing is on this one. This one's slower. But on a modern continuum, in 1.1 nanoseconds, um, it does uh, uh, two floating point multiplies, two floating point adds, two memory reads, two memory writes, and four address computations that are non-trivial. And that's in one memory cycle. Now, on a, on a um, von Neumann machine, right, this takes at least eight memory cycles. Just because you don't have all the parallel buses. If you're going to read from memory and write from memory, that can't happen at the same time. And uh, so there's all these things, uh, all these tricks you can do here if you carefully enough plan ahead. There's also other tricks about this... Uh, uh, these bandpass filters, one of the things I take advantage of is, hey, you know, in these bandpass filters, uh, like one physical model might have 50 resonances, 50 main resonances. So you've got 50 bandpass filters that all have the same input. Well, if you can arrange your filter architecture such that that input computation is only done once, since it's the same for all your 50 filters, right, then you save, that basically is free at that point. Um, anyway, the long short of it is this in one and a half memory cycles because each loop here has three instructions and and does uh, uh, anyway just because the way it works out in one and a half memory cycles it can do a bandpass filter it can do a resonance which is you know just insane I mean that's not even enough on a standard architecture to read up a value and store it back so uh, it's sort of fun you know if you're willing to do it you can. Uh, you can highly optimize things. So I'm just sort of trying to give a flavor of what's there. Um, and, and it's similar to see, like, uh, we don't have any classes teaching this, but we have classes that teach GPU programming. And it's a similar thing there. Like, if you really learn GPU programming, you're not just programming the same as you would program, you know, Java on your cell phone, right? You're really using a language. You're using all sorts of features, trying to really make algorithms that make best use of, of what you've got. Oh, here's another thing. This is something I talked about before in the history section, is multi-rate computations. In this thing here, this computes the filter coefficients, this last page. And it's just written in C. Why? Because filter coefficients are only recomputed once a millisecond, usually. You can do it faster than you can make sure. You can click the extreme button. Uh, usually people don't, and it'll cost you a lot more, because all of a sudden, you know, the, that filter is costing you 50 times as much, or 100 times as much as it would have if you had not done that. But in any case, then it'll recompute the uh, coefficients every sample. But uh, here, uh, this computes the filter coefficients. It's just written in C because it only happens once a millisecond, which is like once in a blue moon. Who cares? You know, and it doesn't have to be that efficient. But still, it has to be efficient enough. The sine cosine routine, for instance, is called in here the one that's optimized because sine cosine is an expensive enough computation. It's not built into the hardware, and it's expensive enough computation. Yeah, you want an optimized one. And sure, I could use the optimized one that came with the library, but this one's four times faster. So, you know, a factor of four matters. Cool. Um, so, just, um, this is something that I haven't gotten into because... These devices for the continuums now, I actually have, I, I wrote a note about this on Piazza because somebody asked, I just hadn't seen it um, until today. But um, yeah, a modern continuum, the ones that are not 12 year old, like the ones you have, have six times the processing power. They use a newer version of the Shark chip, which has twice the processing power per chip, and I use three chips. And yes, it is hard. That's another thing, it's really hard to optimize. You can always throw more chips at things, but it's really hard to make full use of all your processors. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges there. On the other hand, the Egan matrix is a very restricted environment. And while it's hard, it's certainly possible for you to do it. If you had a general purpose programming language, you're saying it'd be much, you know, 
it, usually throwing more processors at something just doesn't do very well. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, um, there you go. Now, in, new from analog devices. Um, analog devices has had this problem. It's like it takes so long to learn this stuff that, you know, at some point for a company, it's just, just do the less cost-effective way. You know, do an x86 and put that into something. Well, people don't usually do that. Maybe an ARM. At least it's more power efficient. But in any case, um, you know, they, but just use a standard processor and don't, don't worry about it. Um, and, you know, then your programs are already familiar with it. It's okay. And in fact, that's how a lot of the TI DSPs work. They're, they have horrible assembly languages, and they're not really specialized for audio. They're just, you know, have all sorts of things that are good for audio, good for video. And they had their engineers write super optimized subroutines for all the standard stuff that people want to do. Actually, it turns out, all the standard stuff that people want to do covers a lot of ground. Right, and it turns out that if you have super fast FFTs and you have super fast this, super fast that, and you have all these subroutines, maybe that's enough for you. In audio, it doesn't do so well. Like in the Egan Matrix, there are really new algorithms that I came up with, and so I need to be able to write a semi language, and that's that's where that breaks down. But the TI chips sell way better because they provide the libraries that are already super fast, and you program in an environment you're used to. So um, analog devices answer to that, which may or may not fly, I don't know. Um, um, they put two of their Shark DSPs and an ARM all on one chip. They've already been putting in, you know, the, their DSPs already came with like what used to be 30 or 40 peripheral chips, just everything people could possibly want, you know, different kinds of encoding for audio, different kinds of, you know, your CAN bus if you need that, or, you know, anything, everything in the kitchen sink that they could think of, they just stuck on the silicon. Uh, uh, well, now what they did is they put two of those DSPs on there that share memory with an ARM. And the idea of the ARM processor is, well, in the Internet of Things or something, hey, you just run Linux on that or whatever you want to run on that. You have your normal environment. And the Shark DSPs are just basically, at that point, your super efficient algorithms that you run. So the nice thing for somebody like me, if I were in the world still consulting, I could write super efficient algorithms for people that they can run on a chip like this from their point of view, the chip is the same as any other ARM. You know, it's the same as 96% of all the computers in the world, right? They use all the same ARM tools, use all the same ARM stuff, but they can call a subroutine that just outperforms everything by a factor of 100. Just like you would when you're Bitcoin mining on a, on a GPU, right? You're, you're, you know, you're using it because it can totally outperform everything else. Um, and uh, so that's what they're doing. So they're trying to make it more like a GPU model where on one, on one chip, you have your standard computer, slow as a dog, mostly uses off-chip memory, um, you know, but that's what people are used to from their desktop computers and stuff, and they just do that, and, but then you can have super, super fast processing of specialized algorithm that some specialist can write for you, and you don't have to have everybody change their life in order to use this technology. So I, I wish them luck, I don't know if it'll work. Does that make sense? Cool. There's a lot of other um, DSP programming environments that we could talk about. There's a lot of general languages. One of them that I really like and that the editor is written in, caveat here, you know when you start up that editor, uh, well, now we have a program that at least puts up a window that says, we're starting up. And then, you know, what, a minute later or something, it starts or something like that. But, yeah, so the environment takes a long time to start up. That's mostly because our program got more and more complicated and has thousands upon thousands of objects in it now, and it's, yeah, whatever. Um, but it's very convenient to write in. It's beautiful language. It's the only graphic language that I know of that's a real graphic language. It's not like Simulink or something where you're, you know, this is a real graphic language. So if you get out of here and you're interested in, well, what's a language that peop that musicians actually use especially musicians associated with universities, but even outside of universities. You know, lots of people use this thing. Um, I strongly suggest Max MSP. Can't teach everything. Sometimes there's a CS course here about it. Sometimes. Uh, you can keep your eyes open for it. But um, this is just a part of the editor. You don't have to worry about what it does. But it's graphically laid out. I like it because, uh, well, here's some reasons for me. Um, it has nice MIDI capabilities. And because I'm so used to the incredible processing power, if I want to optimize, of a uh, shark, um, uh, I, I don't use it for audio. But it certainly has audio capabilities. 
Um, uh, it's cross-platform, which means uh, you don't have to try to figure everything out for Mac and PC. Um, um, I like it uh, programming in 2D. I really like the graphic layout. You know, it, it's uh, not a negative. Um, also, because I'm a C programmer by, by training, um, they have all sorts of outs. Like, sometimes in a graphic language, you know, you don't want to put up gazillion different objects to do some function, you know, to do, I don't know what, SPRINF or something. Um, well, they have those built into. So, so they have, you know, they, they have things for uh, uh, very nicely done. Uh, uh, the cool thing is my technically talented music friends know Max, which is very different than my assembly language program, which I do on my own. And and this is you know is really my thing, and I sit around and think about it a lot. But I don't I don't really have people I can share with. I don't have people I can do shared projects with and stuff. And it would take years to train somebody up enough so that they wouldn't just wreck it. Uh, so I do it all myself. Um, but um, uh, Max is also has this other thing that's just amazing in this world is it has really great interactive documentation. So if you just want to start on your own, they have really good student prices. They have all sorts of things. I, I would look into it. Now, is this a substitute for the shark? No, it's a different thing. In fact, we're using it as the screen interface for the shark. And boy, it's, it's really nice for that. Um, yes, it starts up slow. We'll, we'll solve that someday, or in two years, computers will get faster, and that'll go away. But um, uh, it is, uh, I, I would strongly suggest Max MSP as an environment. There are also... Um, uh, in addition to Max MSP, another one is Reactor, very different than this, but also very much used. Uh, uh, and uh, Reactor is a uh, native instrument, um, a German company. And then there's Kima, Symbolic Sound, which is in town here. And I'd say those three are, are the big ones. Each one of them are quite different from each other and all, all have their individual benefits. One of the benefits of Kima is it has dedicated hardware which means that when somebody else tries to use something that you did, it actually works exactly right. It doesn't cut any corners. It doesn't, you know, it really, it really will 100% work. Um, there's also just, because Kima has been in development sort of as its own thing for so long, there's a lot of unique things about Kima that are great. Reactor is really great um, because you can make very professional-looking final things. This editor is probably the most professional thing you'll ever see out of Max MSP. People just don't do that. You know, both in Kima and in Max, people mostly make something for themselves, and once it works, then they're done. Uh, this editor is sort of unusual in that it looks almost like a real program. Are you good? So those are things that are out there. Okay. So um, that is the end of history stuff. I wanted to talk some about, well, what are modern systems? Um, most... Uh, people use DAWs, and most people use pretty straightforward synthesizers in the DAWs that do, do well-defined things. Um, but there's these programming language interfaces, which are widespread. Uh, you can share across the world, and um, each have their own uh, really big advantages. Um, the next main topic, um, I, I wanted to get done with the history at part of this course, and the next, next main topic is about music encoding. And again, music encoding could easily be a course on its own, right? This is a survey course. We're going to spend, a, what, maybe two and a half days or two days on encoding. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, you're scratching the surface. But I think it is important to see this stuff. Uh, it's important to have seen it sometime. Um, so uh, our homework assignment for the next week, uh, uh, our homework assignment for the next week is uh, about music XML. And the first thing I want to say, because this was really disappointing to me, you know, it's funny when you teach something new, like what happens to people that haven't seen this before? Um, I got to tell a quick story, even though I've got to watch the time. But my uh, younger brother is a viola professor here, is a super brilliant musician. Um, but anyway, he uh, took a Pascal programming class when he was a student. And he asked me one day, he, he was getting confused. He was asking me, well, what's the difference between an editor command and a Pascal command? Okay, so, so uh, I don't know if you, you know, editor command at the time, we had a lot more scrolling. You guys used VI or any older editors like that? No? Uh, anyway, editor command lets you move around in the document and, and pick a place. And a Pascal command, of course, is the program itself. And they're like totally different worlds. 
But when somebody starts, it's really hard to tell, like, which one are you in and what are you even doing? And, and so anyway, it really, it was like, whoa, dude. Anyway, he, he finally did well in the course. Uh, but man, you know, it's hard at first. And um, so Music XML is not the same as MIDI. Okay. Um, Music XML is not the same as MIDI. MIDI is a real-time protocol, and we'll talk more about it. And just you know, that's the main part actually of a music encoding thing because it's simpler than these other ones and something really to talk about. Um, but Music XML is not the same as MIDI. Music XML has a lot more information from sheet music in it. Okay, MIDI doesn't have information about is this G major. It doesn't have information about, is there a bar line here? It doesn't have information about, uh, does it say Allegro non troppo? Uh, it doesn't have any of that stuff. Now, you can sort of add text to MIDI, or this, but, but realistically, it doesn't even really tell you, is it a C sharp or a D flat? Or a B double sharp? It doesn't tell you, is it a sextuplet or a, trip, uh, or a triplet? Or, or something else? Right? It doesn't tell you where note beamings are. It doesn't tell you where the slurs start and stop. It doesn't, or, or, or ligatures or whatever you call them for your instrument. Um, so uh, MIDI doesn't have any of that stuff. It's really meant for, hey, this device, either software or maybe a MIDI keyboard or a continuum, wants to play a note on that device. And it's just saying, play this note. Okay, so Music XML. Um, uh, has much more information about sheet music, like clefs, accidentals, note beaming, where note beaming means like the 32nd, you know, they're being connected together here, or the 16th and the 8th. Um, I'm sorry, the 16th and the 16th and 8th. And uh, optionally, even note position on the page. Uh, often it doesn't have that. You know, it depends where it came from. But if it was scanned from music, on the sheet music page, you know, the scanners will just include, oh, it was in this position on the page. And that's the basic thing here about this um, optical music recognition thing that uh, uh, I did with my international collaborator, uh, who happens to be also my sister. But um, uh, we, we did this article and got a lot of attention. Now, the reason this got a lot of attention is not even specifically for music. Uh, this was pretty early on in optical music recognition, and uh, we were able to improve the recognition results of what was at the time the best optical re uh, music recognition engine. Um, but here's a question for you. Do, are any of you, did any of you take classes in computer vision or computer graphics? A little bit? No? Oh. Um, okay, well, yeah, it's hard to come up with examples. Uh, uh, in, in, in other years, I have more grad students that are sitting in front of me and They've seen everything, so they've taken a lot more classes. But anyway, if you did computer vision or you did uh, um, computer graphics, you'll find out that the algorithms are non-overlapping. Like a computer vision system. Uh, say you have a computer vision system that looks at uh, a mountain scenery and is trying to find, oh, what would be a path through these mountains? Okay, that has nothing in common with a program that generates a beautiful image of mountains. They're just unrelated. Or speech recognition and speech synthesis, you know, uh, unrelated. Now, in a human, obviously, they're somewhat related. And AI people always like to, you know, when I was a student, I was an AI, and I, one of the things that really turned me off was this just total untruth that, you know, anybody who's bilingual knows that, oh, your brain has this generic representation of things, and, and uh, uh, that's absolutely not true. For instance, I remember uh, phone numbers in German or in English, and it takes me a long time to translate them, and that's like as generic information as it gets, right? They're just digits, but your brain works in pretty complicated ways. In any case, your brain does have this idea of world knowledge on some level. Like a person, it is true that some people can understand a language and not be able to speak it because there's additional things there. But in general, anybody that can speak a language can also understand it. And, you know, there's a lot of overlap there for humans. So it's not at all this total separation that we have in computers. So the idea is now, uh, the reason this got a lot of attention is this algorithm, after you see what it is, seems almost trivial. But 
we were we had uh, put in already decades of uh, in music printing and in, in, in engraving, as it was called, unless paper. Um, we put in uh, decades of work into that, so we had uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, more advanced uh, uh, music printing programs in the 1990s. But then, uh, optical music recognition was just at a beginning, and uh, uh, so, and actually at the time, uh, we weren't using music XML, we were using NIFF, which is a forerunner of music XML. We, we won't go into it. It doesn't matter. It had the same sort of information in it. Um, and um, uh, so, what happens here? This is something that we would print out. This came from optical music recognition, and um, there were mistakes in the recognition, but the optical music recognition tells you this is a quarter note. You know, this is um, uh, this is a sixteenth uh, note, and here this is an F uh, or F sharp sixteenth note. But the sharp is already in the key signature, so it doesn't tell you to print the sharp. Um, uh, and you know, the program has all these things in it, um, and it tells you here this is a sixteenth, this is an eighth, and this is an eighth. So what we did is we just used the information about note durations. This initially is just about note durations because that's a big part of it. If you can get your note durations right, man, you're in good shape. Um, uh, then the recognition is really saving you a lot of time over re-entering the music. Um, so um, uh, by, by doing the note durations, well, you know, pretty soon you end up with body lines that don't line up. Now, the music printing program can do that because in some kinds of music, yeah, you know, you don't have bar lines that line up, right? That's an okay thing to have, but it wasn't supposed to happen here. And in fact, by the end of the bar, you can tell, well, there isn't the right number of beats. So, you know, it, it, it prints something. Um, but um, a human looking at this can see right away, well, you know, this, this thing here should have been a 16th. But that's pretty hard for a uh, computer to do. The, the reason the optical music recognition program has problems is because, you know, this looks nice, but the originals are often uh, quite blurred by the time they do the recognition and to see a, a 16th flag or a beam like that if it happens to coincide with a bar line it's actually very hard for I mean a staff line it's very hard for it to tell is that just a fat spot on the staff line or is that really what I think I'm looking at or what so the recognition program anyway uh, generated this and the other thing the recognition program does though is it also tells you which is not shown here but it tells you hey this note and this note, it tells the XY position. And they had the same X position. So we have a simple proofread and correct algorithm, which is described more in the fine print, but I just want to give the basic idea here. A proofread and correct algorithm that goes along, and as long as the notes were uh, have the same horizontal alignment as they had in the original, you're happy. Right, so the one that I that we generated, that we regenerated here, might have different white space. You know from the paper that you read for this week that you know the rules for white space and stuff could be iffy, but at least the alignment you know should be about the same. Uh, when things are aligned, if things are not aligned, eh, that's okay. But if, um, so when it gets to a point where it's not aligned, which happened over here on this A, it just goes back and uh, uh, looks at you know the A was the first unaligned thing here, that, um, and uh, uh, it, it goes back at the uh, previous note and that note and tries every combination of possible note durations. Just totally stupid. You know, brainless algorithm. Try every combination. And then see what alignment ends up being the best that matches the original alignment that, that it's reporting. And if all alignments match in several of them, well, then you also go with actual horizontal positions. Because while the white space and spacing rules are variable they're not that variable they're not totally arbitrary anyway it worked very nicely and so it got a huge amount of attention not because we made music sheet music reading so much easier uh so much better but because this was one of the first examples of hey we have a program with enormous amount of world knowledge about sheet music printing how do you use it to improve recognition and this is sort of a doofy way of doing it if, in, in, in my mind, but uh, to my surprise that that was a huge interest in the, in the community, in the AI community specifically. All right? So that's proofread and correct. It's just sort of an example of what can you do if your, notation, if your representation, namely music XML, has lots of extra information. And there's, you know, uh, um, this is one of the things. And, and just like 
it's really important to have MIDI because any synthesizer can talk to any keyboard or at least close to that. I mean, any keyboard can talk to any synthesizer or software can talk to the synthesizer, so on and so forth. Well, the same thing goes with music XML. If you make a sheet music reading program, an OML program, you don't want to also have to write the music editor and the music, you know, whatever, and the thing that does transpositions or whatever you're trying to do with it uh, in order to reprint it so that the singer can sing in that range or whatever you're doing with it. Uh, you don't have to write all that. You can really specialize on the one part of it and then produce that as your product. And so it has sort of the same function of interchange as MIDI does. We good? Be a little careful music XML. If you use the main programs that are out there now, like um, Sonata and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Sonata is a font, uh, uh, Sibelius and, and uh, whatever they are, uh, a program like Sibelius will say they export music XML, but for them actually, if you write a bunch of music, then the publisher can't publish it unless they also have Sibelius. Or if you write it in something else, you know, basically, uh, their business model is force everybody to get Sibelius, so you don't really want to be able to export things. So what happens is it exports most of the information, but not quite enough to really get you a good thing. And it's a little bit like when you're trying to convert from Microsoft Word to, I don't know, Pages or uh, whatever other system you use, right? It almost works, but not quite. Um, so be careful of that. Are we good? Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the homework. Uh, this is for next week. This is not due real soon, but, you know, it's good to talk about it. There's um, some stuff about uh, the, uh, uh, you know, some more Egan Matrix videos. I think that's going to be fine. Um, I, I see that uh, people that had lab tomorrow have re signed up for different times, so that's good. Um, this is two parts of a recognition homework. Now, if you like, like plug and chug homework, hey, this will do it for you. But it's very different than the previous two. If that's not your thing, just heads up. Um, so for the music XML, um, uh, there is a viewer that you can use. You don't have to, but that way you can check, hey, d is, does your music XML is actually correct? Um, and I will email you. I better write this down. I will email you this file so you don't have to retype it or copy it out. I mean, you could copy it out of a PDF, but that's always a hassle. So email... Uh, 402 XML. So music XML is uh, inside. Well, it's an XML notation. Um, what I want you to do here then for this first part of the homework is there's this little piece of music up here and most of it is given to you, but you have a few blanks to fill in here. I guess four of them. And then uh, there is a chord that's missing here. Uh, a code. Uh, a code chord. Well, whatever. Both. Um, the code for a chord. And, uh, and so you got to fill that in. And you know what? You got other chords here. Just kind of, you read this short intro, intro you're reading that's in your uh, notes. And you don't have, you can find a newer version of the intro, but they get longer and longer. And this one has all the stuff you need in it. So um, that's up to you. But, um, and then you can just sort of do like everybody does not, any kind of XML. You copy the other stuff and change it so that it's right for what you're trying to do. Okay, so I just want you to be sort of familiar with what it looks like. It's very verbose compared to your MIDI file for the same thing, which would be tens of bytes. This is hundreds or maybe even over a thousand bytes. Um, but, hey, it's XML. Then the second part of this is music and language. I talked a little bit about that. We'll talk about it next lecture, too. But uh, you have these music and languages. And uh, in, in particular, we're going to read something that Professor Beauchamp wrote about accelerando, like changing tempos. And changing tempos isn't trivial. And it's just like this music printing topic, like all the other topics. It's just good to read about it. Now, when you read it, uh, I guess it was a semester before last, somebody got really mad about it and said, this was the worst written thing they'd ever seen. Um, don't tell that Professor Beauchamp that I quoted him. Anyway, Professor Beauchamp wrote this, but look, to be honest, Okay, so it's maybe you have to sort of read through it and by process of elimination figure out what the heck is he actually saying. But a lot of stuff is like that. You know, you're not going to be able to get very far in electronic music if you expect everything to be perfect prose. So just take the time to read it. And basically what you want to do is write your, figure yourself out a formula for 
these things, and then you just fill in the formula. And you can tell your formula is right or not um, by matching the first few values here. They really should match this. Otherwise, your formula is off. There's some hints down here. Every semester, I get some panicked emails about, oh, no, you know, what do I do? Uh, and I said, well, did you read the hints? And I said, oh, no, I didn't. Uh, just read the hints. Uh, and, and this is sort of a hassle. I mean, this is a plug and chug homework. It'll take you the, you know, you got the four hours to spend on it. Don't spend more than that. But you should be able to uh, do this thing. One of the easy things that easily often confuses people is here. This is octave dot pitch class notation. It's in the reading, and I'll talk about it next lecture. But just keep in mind, this is octave dot pitch class. So uh, octave number is just an integer. Four is, happens to be middle C in this notation. And then um, 0 through 11 is just... C, C sharp, D, D sharp, all the way up to B. But you wouldn't type like uh, 4.12. No more than you would say, oh, you know, now it's 8, what would it be? 861. No, 881, right? Uh, it's 921, and you could say 881, but you don't really go past, you know, 859. Then you say 9 o'clock. Nobody says 860 for 9 o'clock. You could, I guess. My microwave accepts it. It doesn't care. But, but you know, the, the thing is, <laughs> much to the chagrin of my wife. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, you don't say 860, right? You just say 9 o'clock. Same thing happens here. After the decimal point here, uh, you would, uh, will have two digits that go from 0 to 11. You can have more digits. You can see that in reading. But here you'll always have two digits. Anyway, that's not for a while. I'll talk more about it next lecture. I just wanted to give a short intro. Thank you guys very much. Um, okay, I just got to ask online here, do you have to sign up for a different lab? Did, you guys get email from me, right? We're going to send it to everybody? Because I thought that worked. Yeah? And did you get email like this last weekend? Said there was coffee and that somebody must have gotten it because you got uh, Okay, good, good, good. Because... See, there's, there's two things about FPGAs. One thing is, I wish there were an every dang chip. Because nowadays, any modern chip, like these sharks, have hundreds upon hundreds, you know, maybe over a thousand connections inside. But they only got a hundred pins. We'll see you. Thank you. And, um, and so it's so useful to have FPGA to connect between the pins and the outside world. But instead, every, you know, unfortunately, FPGAs were sort of developed with the idea they were to replace the rest of the world. And if you ever have a cool idea, man, don't try to replace the world. Try to work with it. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, so that's too bad. And it's just starting now. And there's very only expensive, very few chips that really have this idea that, hey, you got the core chip in the middle and then FG. Because there, you don't optimize it either. But it's just so useful. Not only they can connect anything to anything, but if you need an AND gate or an extra flip-flop or inverter signals, it's all there. And so that kind of FGA programming... I hope will be everywhere in 10 years, but I don't know. I mean, 
they could have done that. You know, Flash didn't do that. Like Flash is everywhere, and it's newer than FPGA technology. But unfortunately, um, yeah, FPGA hasn't made it. Um, but anyway, so um, uh, but the other thing is, yeah, if you actually optimize an FPGA, like there's some people that really optimize, like all the optimized routing stuff. Man, you know, you're talking about like five orders of magnitude easily of improved performance because the routing is a mess, right? You have really limited routing options, but you know, if this is your life, and and again, you know, if if you almost nobody uses FPGAs does that, but. The, yeah, yes. The few people that do that are in huge demand because there are really highly, you know, things that are highly parallel or can be made into a highly parallel thing. But yeah, unfortunately, most FPGA use, like, like I, one of the worst FPGA uses I know of, which is I think the single most common, is people put an FPGA on their board because they want to future proof it. So they don't actually know what they want to do. And they put an FPGA there to make sure, you know, it's like, it increases the cost insanely, and it almost never actually solves any problem, and it's just really bad. I just thought it was funny because I was, I was presenting my project to the DA, and I was like, this is horrible, this is horrible, this is horrible. Yeah, yeah. I showed it to them, and they were just like, oh, impressive. And I'm like, you know nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but that's actually a good point. Yeah, FPGAs are, are like that. They're, you know, the routing problem there. And it's much worse than the printed circuit board routing problem. Um, and, and unfortunately, also, early in the FPGA world, not only did they think they'd replace all chips, but they also didn't want to have any special hardware skills. So they tried to hide all the routing, and they try, you know, they have these horrible languages that try to look like programming rather than giving you control over the things you want control over. And if you do schematic capture, if you do, all it does is translate it to that language. <laughs> so, you know, you, you don't really have any control over anything. So it's very hard to use the tools to do it. But there are people that can. And and you know it's yeah it's incredible that that's actually a good example, yeah. um, uh, and a much more kind you know the audio example is just rare, but if you had 